In October okay, 2021, I started having trouble sleeping. At first, I didn't pay much attention to it. I thinking it was just a matter of adjusting to my new apartment in London. But after countless sleepless nights, I realized that I needed to investigate the cause of my insomnia. Armed with an application that could capture uh, ambient noises, I recorded every sleep movement and sound across a few weeks of, of my sleeps. And what uh, I really wanted to know what was the cause of my insomnia, if it was just anxiety or maybe some external noises disrupting my sleep or maybe ghosts. And after several weeks of data collection, I took a look at the results and I saw a clear pattern. During the early hours of, my, of the morning, when I was still asleep, I heard the noise of the buses coming from the street below my bedroom window. They were the reason I couldn't sleep peacefully. While the noise wasn't loud enough to fully awaken a person, it was definitely enough to disturb my sleep. And from this observation and data, Morpheus was born. Morpheus is the name of the god of dreams and sleep. And it's also a fusion of art and science that uses the sound data recorded during a night to create a visual representation on paper. Here, each brushstroke and, uh, and curve on the canvas tells a story, a tale of sound waves moving through times. And the lines shows the amplitude as the ups and downs of sonic vibration. But in the middle of this artwork, a broken circle emerged. Um, and this broken circle is a symbol of my disrupted sleep with its peak showing towards the early morning, as you can see on the bottom uh, corner of the screen. So raise your hand if you ever had experienced insomnia at least once in your life. But well, you're not alone. In Italy, uh, the country where I'm from, approximately 13.4 million people suffer from insomnia, according to the latest data from the Italian Sleep Medicine Association, which is enough people to fill the Wembley Stadium 128 times. So I could have show you this uh, data with a traditional bar chart or a dashboard but instead i wanted to present the data in a different way and also i wanted to tell you a story about it so this work Morpheus, like many of my creative experimental pieces aims to make the data contained in an audio file or sound for example tangible like a proper photograph of the moment the goal is to gain, um, is to experience sounds not only through our sense of hearing, but also through our eyes. A similar theories have been explored in the past by artists like Kandinsky and more recently by Brian Eno. Even Freud's psychological theories on sublimation, which shapes unconscious feelings through narrative and representation, touch upon these concepts. And if you want to know more about my process, I'll point you to my TEDx talk, um, How Sound Data Can Recreate Lost Memories, where I explain the links between sonic data and the sublimation in details. So by using sonic data, I started to create photographs. Photographs depicting uh, everything about my life, from relationships to emotions to uh, even lost uh, images. And we live in a world abundant with data, and it's our responsibility to unlock it, its potential. So today I'm going to tell you stories, three stories actually, involving data from uh, sound, images and perfumes. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Tiziana Alocci. I am an Italian designer and I've been living in London for more than 10 years now. Um, and I spent um, 10 years also, a little bit more actually, working as an information designer in various design studios, focusing on a, a wide range of fields from sustainability to sport, from culture to social causes. Uh, I've been freelancing since 2018 and now my work leans, to, leans, more, um, leans more towards the direction of data-driven art, but I carry on working on commercial projects through my own studio, Necessity.inc. And my mission is to make the inaccessible accessible through visual storytelling, data, but also sound uh, and even art, because I wanted, I really want to work with uh, most innovative um, names to create beautiful and functional experiences that truly touch the art and the mind of people. So now I'm going to show you a quick video to summarize uh, the body of work that, uh, that I do.
in um, 2016 and 17, with my ex-colleague Piero Zagami, we co-founded Market Cafe magazine, which is an independent magazine about data visualization. And I just want to spend a couple of words uh, about this project because uh, in August we launched the issue number eight, which is about digital humanities. And we interviewed uh, people worldwide talking about uh, what they do with data. Um, it, every issue is sold out. It's very independent project. It's sold only through our website and independent bookstores. And it's been the world first independent magazine about data visualization. But also it started as a, a self-initiated project. And it was what, um, basically uh, helped me to uh, move towards something that I really like and enjoy, which is teaching. And since 2019, I've been teaching data visualization at the MA in data visualization at London College of Communication and also at the Chelsea College of Art. And um, while I teach data visualization, I always combine my practice experience with design theory. Um, and I also had the pleasure to lecture all around the world from Mexico to, to Thailand. And um, of course, I'm interesting, interested in design, but I'm even more interested in people. Uh, and that's the secret. We must care more about the people on the other side of the screen than what is displayed on the screen. And this is a great quote from a great book called Good Service. So, but this journey hasn't been easy. Uh, when I first moved to London, my English wasn't great. Sometimes articulating concepts and explaining projects in meetings was challenging. So I remember I decided to focus on a kind of universal language um, made of numbers and images. And uh, I asked myself, how can I communicate data and information in the simplest way possible? So I started using analogies, both spoken and visual, to explain concept. So something like fast as a train or tall as a six story building and so on. And I made it my superpower. But it didn't take long for me to realize that stories uh, are told to an audience. Uh, but very often we publish and design uh, data visualization and projects without considering who we are talking to. And uh, especially whether the person we are addressing actually understand the impact of what numbers uh, of the numbers had uh, on their own lives. In the English language, there is a term that helps us, which is relatable, which is not just a, a famous uh, Netflix shows, but it means allowing a person to feel they can identify with someone or something. And uh, during the pandemic, I tried to do something similar, I'll show you this quickly as an example, just to put in perspective, there was this news that in Italy, uh, 312,000 people uh, lost their job um, and they were women. So I wanted to show how big is this number and I did that by comparing the number to the capacity, for example, of the largest stadium in Italy or the largest um, passenger cruise uh, at the time. And uh, the feedback that I received, I showed this on Instagram, the feedback that I received was, was great. And the people told me, I, I never thought about making these analogies and now I really understand how big numbers are. So we live in a world abundant with data and it's our responsibility to unlock its potential. Uh, in my work, I've made all kinds of traditional data visualization you can possibly imagine, but today I will tell you three stories involving data from sound, images and perfumes to bring, uh, to, bring um, to accompany you uh, on this sensory data journey. So let's start with music, because we all relate to music. In 2019, I started collaborating with a record label based in Berlin, and they produce electronic music like techno, um, made by various DJ. And they discovered my work on Instagram. They got in touch, told me, oh, we really like your work and your style. Can you make uh, a graphic for the cover of record that we are about to release? And I said, yes, I would love to do it. Um, send me the data. And they told me, but we don't have any data, but we have the music. So well, I accept the challenge. And um, back in the time, I was reading a book. And uh, the, in this book, it was mentioned that in 1912, the British art critic Roger Fry coined the term visual music to describe the work of uh, the painter Kandinsky, 
who was not only a skilled painter, but also a talented musician. And for him, the emotional power of music provided inspiration for abstract paintings. They used lines, shapes, and colors to create a visual connection between music and visual representation. So I started to do research, uh, data research and visual research to see what was done before. Visual research is also a very important part of my work. You will notice that 99% uh, of the work that I do feature the shape of a circle. I grew up in Italy, we have an abundance of churches and a circle is a very recurring architectural element. And so from 2019, uh, we we together produced and I designed over 20 different uh, data-driven album covers and each of these uh, little circle is a cover of a record, a vinyl record which shows data, sonic data basically contained in a song of each album. And there is again now another quick video that I want to show you to um, just to display the, the variety of the projects. And this was the first cover that I made, it was October 2019. Um, and then uh, I made others until the most recent one that I released uh, was September, so a few weeks ago. Um, not with the same record label, but this was a different management. Uh, but I was really, really honored to work on the new album uh, called Metallic Spheres in Color, made by The Orb and uh, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. So beyond images, uh, now let's talk about images, in, um, but specifically about tattoos. And tattoos for me are a unique form of personal data. Um, potentially some of you have at least a tattoo or know someone with a tattoo, but a tattoo is a very old practice that gained particular popularity um, in the 19th century, especially when convicted criminals in Britain were sent to Australia. Um, and during this long journey, uh, authorities have recorded the numerous meanings and the shapes and designs of tattoos uh, on the convicts, including, uh, and these tattoos were including words of love, hope, pain, friendship, and, uh, and even religion. But above all, as a voluntary procedure, tattoos provide valuable information about non elite voices that would otherwise be difficult to find in non historical data sets. In uh, 2018, I was commissioned by the British Library in London to make two artworks uh, for the upcoming exhibition Visualizing Victorian News. And one of the artwork was about reconstructing the lives of criminals through tattoos. And so tattoos serve as a visual records of stories, uh, of experiences and identities. They hold cultural significance, capturing, uh, capturing the narratives of individuals who might not have um, a voice in historical records, which is really common. But by studying tattoos, we can uncover hidden stories, understand subcultures, and gain insights into the lives of marginalized community. Uh, and the voices of marginalized people are always difficult to find in historical data set. But in this case, one group is an exception because we have a lot of data on individuals convicted through the English criminal justice system in the 19th century. So I use a, a database, an online database um, called the Digital Panopticon, which holds the secrets of the past and where thousands of criminal records and the tattoos um, that tell their stories are stored. And we are talking about something like more than 60,000 tattoos records. And it's a treasure trove of information that paints a picture of a long time, of, long, um, of a time long gone. But, uh, but not forgotten. And by bringing together the seemingly separate words of crime and tattoo, we can uncover the hidden narratives of those um, who have gone before us and uh, give them a voice. And through this data, uh, primarily composed of images and tattoo design, I was able to reconstruct a narrative. For example, I studied the mention 
of the word tattoo in a selection of British newspapers to discover that it only, uh, it only became a popular topic towards the end of the century, mainly due to extensive coverage of uh, a sensational crime. And this crime was called the Thickborn case, which also has a Wikipedia page if you want to learn more, and involved the alleged death of Roger Thickborn in a shipwreck and the claims of a man named Thomas, Thomas Castro to be uh, Roger Thickborn. And uh, the case had over 20, uh, 200 witnesses, really, but was only the testimony of one about the distinctive tattoos that the claimant did not have um, led to his claim basically to being rejected. So if you want to learn more about the case, which is really fascinating, there is a whole Wikipedia page about it. So last but not least, the third case study is a work that I've done in, uh, this summer in June about uh, visualizing perfumes. And while I work with uh, the most unusual data set, never before I've been asked to visualize the very essence of perfumes and, uh, and aromas, and it was very, very exciting for me. Um, so when I, start, when I started working on this project, um, one of the main issue was the time constraint. I only had uh, two weeks, and uh, and the, the 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 shape of the data because um, I had thirty two individual data sets, and each data set were made by a lot a lot of uh, columns and uh, and rows uh, in the orders of hundreds and hundreds. So I had a lot of data to handle with. So um, the immediate thought was, I can't do everything manually, and all the works that you've seen so far, uh, they are not coded, so they're done manually, because I, I'm not a coder, I don't code. So I started to play with processing a little bit, and I was trying to find a shape that could in some way uh, make sense. Um, and I tried different solutions, I tried different iteration. Um, sometimes I was maybe uh, finding a shape that could be, it could tell a story, could be interesting. I started then to combine uh, these um, uh, shapes with, uh, uh, with Illustrator. Um, something was vaguely interesting, but it was still very far from what I usually do. Um, then I remember, of course, I'm not a coder. Maybe I should just, you know, start from a square one and trust my my process. So um, I go back to the very beginning. I went to the museum. I looked at some art, and uh, I noticed that there were a lot of uh, references to natures. And then I did some research, and I found out that gardens have been a popular subject in art history, often symbolizing a theme such as life or renewal or growth. And from ancient uh, Egyptian tombs paintings to Renaissance tapestries, gardens have been depicted in various styles and mediums throughout the ages. Many famous artists like Van Gogh and Monet, for example, have also inspired by have also been inspired by gardens and uh, incorporate them into their works. So I started playing with a with a software that allows you to create network diagrams by playing with some algorithms. And um, it was very fun and unusual because I never used this software, which is called Gephi, for my project. But I started to see that some shapes resembling the shape of flowers or gardens were appearing uh, almost by magic. And this is one of the discarded options uh, called Garden of Fragrances. Um, so I thought maybe I am the right path, uh, but I care a lot about the context when I, when I design and I live in London and even though London is far from the, the poetic uh, imaginary of the French countryside, I wanted to capture the invisible trends that bind uh, perfumers and their fragrances, uh, transforming complex data into a visual symphony of lines nodes and, uh, and patterns. So I look into nature and uh, I wanted to replicate nature using data as a creative material to create an olfactory fingerprint. And I finally landed to, to the concept that um, was chosen, uh, which is called Scented Connections, which is a series of 32 unique uh, data portraits that embody the network of fragrances and aromas used to create a scent. And um, inspired by the intricate web of relationships that form the backbone of a fragrance and by nature's shapes, of course, each portrait here represents a unique olfactory fingerprint 
charting the journey of a fragrance from its creation to its ultimate destination. So this was one of the projects that I liked the most, even though I like most of the projects that I do. I'm really grateful for that. But this was very unusual and was the first time that I was um, working on a sensory data set made of something that is impossible to see and to hear. So last but not least, uh, I just want to nick the last second of your time to do some shameless promotion because next month I'm launching my very first physical product, which is a limited edition of 10 handmade skateboards featuring my sonic data visualization, Victoria Night. Um, so please join the mailing list. Here there is a, a QR code that you can scan with your phone and uh, join the mailing list to know the date of the launch and uh, see some cool behind the scene and making of uh, each individual board, which is made um, uh, by hand in uh, here in this London, uh, one by one. So that's all for me. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to your question. Thanks again.